All right, so excellent. Uh, a very good evening to all of you. Um, and, you know, first of all, I would say congratulations, um, you know, because I see the intent that uh, on a nice Friday evening, right, when you had so many options, you actually decided to come over today uh, to uh, uh, this webinar. It tells me a couple of things. A, it tells me that you're driven for the GMAT. It tells me that your intent is very high. That's one of the biggest traits that I've seen in people who succeed, which is having a very strong intent. So all of you have that. So pat yourself on the back. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, the second thing is, I'm cognizant of the fact that I have to make sure that the next one hour is uh, worth your time. So I can assure you that I'm going to crunch my experience and try to bring to you certain actionable tactics, um, certain techniques by which even with your current GMAT uh, preparation level, uh, I can still say that if you are able to apply these guessing techniques, these guessing strategies, um, you should be able to see uh, improvement in your, uh, you know, GMAT score for about 30, 40 points, right? If you apply it uh, well. So before we get started, uh, <coughs> I just wanted to understand how many of you have booked your dates? If you can just go ahead and type on the chat, uh, you know, window, so I get to know. So if you can tell me um, if you have booked your GMAT dates, I think there is a slight lag, so I think um, if you if you are able to chat with me, I'll be able to kind of understand and see if uh, uh, you are able to hear me, if you are able to understand me. Great, great. So I see that. Uh, so Samarth mentioned that I'm not audible, so let me do this. Uh, let me just go ahead and uh, let me... Uh, share my window with you so so that you see my screen yeah so it's audible excellent so what i'm going to do is uh, i'm just going to be sharing my uh, screen so i see um, there are uh, a few of you who have booked it in september in two weeks uh, some of you have not um, but uh, you also have some plans of taking it in october right um, Great. So what we will be doing in uh, today's session is irrespective of whether you booked it or not, I am assuming that uh, you have started your preparation and you have been solving questions. And uh, if you have been solving questions, then, uh, you know, this session, I'm going to be taking questions that you might have probably seen, correct? But I will still try to show how to extract value. Right. The fundamental difference between solving a question when you are at home and solving a question on the day of the test is understanding how your brain works. So what we're going to do today is we are going to kind of deep dive into, uh, you know, looking at uh, questions. When could we guess them? Is this a question worth guessing? What should be my overall strategy getting in? Correct. Uh, just a couple of ground rules. Let's make sure that you uh, type it in the chat window if you have a question. Uh, and uh, please allow me some time to uh, respond to it. I'm just going to be making a note of it. And I might take the questions uh, a little later. So just be careful. Um, you know, uh, sometimes people end up, uh, you know, repeating the questions. So just ask me. I'll make sure that I'll uh, end up answering. And if one of you is able to hear me, I assume that uh, all of you are uh, able to hear me. Correct. So that's what I'm going to use. So in case uh, someone is not, uh, you know, hearing me, uh, I would request the others uh, to please confirm whether you are indeed able to hear me. Um, so as I said, uh, we will try to use uh, this one hour and we'll try to keep it uh, productive. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, just on. Yeah, so. Yeah, so just I'm just trying to uh, this so you should be able to see uh, the screen over here. Um, so let me just get, share the screen. So yeah, let's get the application window. Yeah, so I just shared the screen. 
So hopefully you are now able to uh, see the presentation. Yeah. So what we will do today is uh, I have my uh, you know iPad on which I see the chat window. So uh, we will be discussing specifically on general uh, guessing strategies. Correct. And uh, are you able to see the general guessing strategy? Yeah. Okay. Great. So um, the just just a very quick uh, point on this, uh, which is uh, I have been a crack, I'm the CEO of Crack Verbal and I'm an MBA coach. And uh, what I'm really I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, talking about myself, but uh, uh, what I would just like to say is that whatever techniques that we're going to have um, today are going to be techniques that uh, actually work on the day of the test. One of the biggest uh, feedback that I've gotten from students saying that, you know, a lot of techniques that we hear are techniques that work well when we solve questions on the OG. But how do we actually take that and uh, use the same techniques? Somewhere, when I use it on the test, it's not working, it's backfiring. What do we do, right? So I'm going to be talking about that uh, very quickly. Uh, I'm the founder of Crack Verbal, and uh, we have been I've been teaching GMAT uh, in, at Crack Verbal since 2006. And... Um, I also, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm predominantly a verbal faculty. Uh, I think uh, you have already uh, seen Aditya, who took a session on inequalities a couple of days ago, and uh, he is a quant faculty at Crack Verbal. So uh, we together form the uh, team which looks into the product. Um, uh, just want to kind of jump directly. So make sure that you get, I just want to talk about just a couple of resources. So in case you have not done that, please go to YouTube and subscribe to our Crack Verbal channel. Uh, we have got uh, a lot of videos on strategies, on GMAT, on, uh, you know, the whole application bit. Uh, in case you have not seen that, uh, probably you can do so, right? And uh, yeah, so that's what I had. Uh, now what I'm going to do is... Uh, I'm going to now give you a question, correct? So instead of me getting into the theory and explaining the theory to you, why don't I do this? Why don't I give you a question, correct? And we're going to time ourselves. So I'm going to give you two minutes and then I'm going to give you uh, three minutes, right? So I'm going to give you a total three minutes for it. So let's start with two minutes and then I will let you know at the end of two and a half minutes and the end of three minutes, correct? Um, and uh, let's see how you do. So all of you ready? With uh, so Kana, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So why don't you just take the next question? This is an official question, right? Uh, so um, all of you ready? Okay, take a deep breath, right? So let's get started. Your time starts now. Okay, two minutes over. 
please uh, start typing your answers. I'm going to give you another minute. All right, uh, three minutes over. So um, I see that uh, most of you have solved it and uh, I have a variety of different answers, but uh, most of you seem to have picked D for Delta. And uh, I think the second uh, most uh, um, opted answer option is uh, C for Charlie. And then we just have uh, a few people with uh, A for Alpha, correct? So let me just count the number of people who have uh, given me the answer. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. Okay, so about uh, um, you know uh, 35 of you have uh, given me the answer. Correct. Now think about it. And I, I, I'm saying that uh, being fully respectful, right? Uh, but if I had just like a room full of, let's say there is a robot, correct? And the robot is trained to randomly uh, pick a letter between answer option A and D, correct? Uh, think about it. What would the robot do? The robot would have, uh, if I have like five such robots, I would have uh, each robot having at least, um, you know, for example, a would be chosen by, you know, seven times, correct? B would be chosen seven times. C would be chosen seven times. D would be chosen seven times. And E would be chosen seven times. All of you understand this? There is a reason why I'm saying this because I'm going to uh, get to it very shortly, okay? So first of all, uh, you realize that uh, this is a question which has a lot of data. So I'm pretty sure that when you started solving, you started solving by uh, writing down what is heavy rain fall greater than two inches moderate more than one no more than two which is less than equal to two correct and then it says light rainfall which is greater than zero right but no more than one inch which means uh, less than equal to one inch or no rainfall which means zero correct now think about it right it gives you just one data point. If you think about it, it's just like two data points. First data point is in 1990, there were fewer days with light rainfall and fewer days with moderate rainfall. Correct. Yet the total rainfall for the year was 20% higher in 1990 than in 1910. Think about it. Now, this is the way my brain works. My brain says that, uh, you know, if you think about it, there are only three types. Uh, light rainfall, moderate rainfall, heavy rainfall. You are telling me that uh, in 1990, uh, uh, there were fewer days with light rainfall, fewer days with moderate rainfall, correct? And you have, uh, you know, overall, there is a 20% higher rainfall in 1990 than in 1910. How will this happen? This can happen only if the number of days of heavy rainfall was higher that is what your brain was expecting right remember this is gmat right so gmat knows that this is the way you're going to think correct so the question says if the statements above are true then it is also possible that remember that's the question it's saying it's also possible it may be true correct and then you read answer option a and somewhere answer option a goes ahead and directly conflicts with the answer that you have thought in your head. So in your head, what you're trying to uh, search for is the number of days with heavy rainfall was higher in 1990. That is what your brain is expecting. So what do you do? You eliminate answer option A, 
correct so whoever did whatever i told you in your mind if that is what you did can you just go ahead and type yes in the chat okay <clears throat> so that i can of understand that we are progressing in the same way right but you expecting a different answer choice and then you looked at a and a seemed to be you know the direct opposite of what was expected yeah so you can have eliminated a excellent so now let's look at b b says the number of days with some rainfall but no more than 2 inches was the same in 1990 then as in 1910 correct now if you read answer option b it says the number of days with some rainfall but no more than 2 inches now what is some but no more than 2 uh, it means that you are looking at uh, both moderate and light rainfalls correct but we know the data provides us that the number of days with uh, moderate and light rainfall was higher in 1910 than in 1990 so this answer option directly conflicts with what is given to us as data so can i eliminate answer option b right so now what i do i eliminate answer option b okay now i go to answer option c answer option c says the number of days with some rainfall but no more than 2 inches same thing whatever we had in answer option b correct but it says was higher in 1990 than in 1910 please go back and read it it very clearly says that in 1990 there were fewer days so answer option c also cannot be right so all of you okay with why i eliminated answer option b and c yeah okay now what happens you go to d now your brain reads it by now by the way your brain is also exhausted correct because it's used up a lot of mental bandwidth plus you are also conscious that time is running out i might have already said 2 minutes over so that's also playing in your head now you are left with answer option d and d now you read d the total number of inches of rain that fell on days with moderate rainfall in 1990 was more than twice what it had been in 1910 now the moment you read this phrasing your brain basically gets confused correct there's a short circuit it's like was more than twice what it had been correct now let's assume that you read answer option d you did not understand answer option d what do you do you hold on to answer option d correct then what do you do is you go to answer option e e says the average amount of rainfall per month was lower in 1990 than in 1910 see if the total rainfall was 20% lower then the monthly rainfall also has to be 20% lower right average monthly rainfall correct so answer option e directly conflicts with the last sentence if the total is lower then the average also has to be low now answer option e also got eliminated now what you do you say okay so now i am left with d i have no option let me just pick d so you pick d whatever i told you did you do according to uh, what i said those who pick d especially if you can just type in yes did i read your mind right so excellent so all of you did that you used process of elimination here is bad news for you d is the wrong answer okay d is the wrong answer the correct answer option is a for alpha and let's see what happens read answer option d d says that the total number of inches of rain correct that fell on days with moderate rainfall in 1990 correct was more than twice what it had been correct what is it it is the total number of inches of rain correct so think about it how is it possible look at the definition of what is called as moderate rainfall moderate rainfall means more than one but no more than 2 inches correct which means even if i have 1.000 something correct if i take twice it ends up becoming not moderate it ends up becoming heavy because it's more than 2 right now let's understand answer option a correct so answer option d is wrong let's look at answer option a the number of days with heavy rainfall was lower in 1990 than in 1910 remember the question is saying 
is it also possible which means it may be true can it be true is it possible we are looking at possibility correct now you think about it maybe there was just two days of heavy rainfall in 1990 right but like what we saw in mumbai or chennai right on those two days it rained like 100 you know uh, inches correct and just those two days of 100 inches basically ended up uh, making 1990 correct um uh higher than 1910 correct so this is why this question is tricky because i remember i think you know two or three of you had picked answer option a i'll go back to what i said if i had programmed robots sitting in front of me seven of them would pick the answer correct so what is it that actually makes a uh, intelligent human beings like you fall for the trap correct so that's what we need to understand we need to get into the mind of the gmat setter correct see whatever i'm giving you right now do you realize on the gmat when you are seeing the question this is the same thought process that you're going to have so what we are trying to do is we are getting into that thought process and we are trying to see what is it that we can change how do we maximize our impact on the test correct so all of you comfortable why a for alpha is the right answer that even on few days because what's happening is remember the conclusion is talking about total rainfall right whereas we are given information only about the number of days so if you think about it number of days into you know average rain per day is equal to total rainfall correct so that's where gmat is confusing you right so what are the specific take away that we have for this question correct um you see this i have already been able to guess think about it the gmat test setter right is spending 2000 dollars per question remember that okay he has all the data in the world he has analyzed the data because he has already given it to you as an experimental question so he has the luxury of tweaking it correct so what happens is he is going to give you an answer choice that really i mean the reason you you pick d was because what i would call as the last man standing you know like i eliminated everything else i just have d even if my brain doesn't work you know i'm just going to go ahead and pick it so what does it really tell us it also tells us that you pick d not because you liked d okay you picked because that was the only one left and what happened automatically your brain started justifying why d is right correct so now when you go back and look at d you might see uh, a lot of issues with it but when you read it your brain actually convinced you that yes maybe d is the right answer and this is what i want you to uh, think okay and i want you to maybe write it down uh, at the place where you study every day correct the whole focus on gmat right you need to understand is you don't need to solve the problem you need to get to the right answer i'm going to say this again you do not need to solve the problem you need to get to the answer and there is a difference between both these statements correct if i'm going to approach the question right from a solving mentality gmat will always have traps for me okay but if i'm going to approach it differently and if i'm going to look at it and saying that i want to get to the answer then you'll realize that life will be a lot easier in general correct remember that you know even this particular question um a lot of times people mistake a maybe true question with a must be true question correct so the guessing over here karan is that you ended up eliminating right answer option a right you ended up eliminating answer option a and that was the biggest problem so make sure that you are 100% sure of eliminating the wrong answer okay you need not be 100% sure of picking the right answer i'm fine with that but please don't eliminate the wrong answer option unless or until you are very sure about it remember gmat verbal as such is a test of elimination it is not a test of selection correct and one more thing is you don't need to know how the correct answer option looks like you just need to know how the wrong answer options look like again um, going back to what i said make sure that you are eliminating make sure that you are not selecting again that's where verbal is different from quant 
okay so overall uh, i wanted to set the tone um, you know and we are now going to proceed into guessing techniques for sc for cr and for rc okay uh, and before i get there i just wanted to kind of give you some uh, you know food for thought think about it how long does it take for you from starting reading a particular question okay to actually getting down to the answer options right from reading the question to actually getting down to uh, the you know actual questions right the actual answer options if you realize in sentence correction it is 0 seconds why is it 0 seconds because really when you read answer option a you are actually reading if if let's say the sentence is completely underlined whatever you are reading you are actually reading it uh, you know you are actually spending 0 seconds before you get down to the answer options should i be guessing on sentence correction my take uh, i would not be guessing on sentence correction that's the last uh, topic on which you want to guess a question completely however what you may do is if you are stuck between the last two answer choices please go ahead and uh, make an educated guess right just go ahead and you know pick one of them right that would be my strategy for sentence correction now coming to critical reasoning when can i guess first of all you realize unlike sentence correction it takes me about a minute before i get to the answer options why because i have to read the entire stimulus correct so uh, it takes about 45 to 60 seconds before you see the first answer choice and uh, my take is if you want to guess over here the best bet is for you to guess after you have read the stimulus see if you are going to guess before reading the stimulus it's really a blind guess correct i mean there is no effort you just look at it you just blindly mark something and move on we are talking about you know making a more educated guess and uh, you know you need at least 45 to 60 seconds right before you can actually make a um, guess and might take if you want if you have not really understood the stimulus maybe best for you to uh, just pick an answer choice and move on uh, people have asked me saying arun is there a, another way should i reread well if you did not understand it the first time around it's pointless for you to go back and reread just mark an answer choice and move on in reading comprehension on the other hand you won't get to the question till you have spent about 2 to 3 minutes reading the question uh, reading the passage and then you get to the question correct and the strategy over here is to never guess an entire passage right the way the gmat algorithm works is that you will be heavily penalized if they see you have made a string of errors correct if you get three or four questions wrong on a row you are going to really plummet your scores so my strong advice is instead of you guessing on all the questions perhaps you want to guess on one among the three or four questions correct and we will be talking about in detail uh, what could be the type of question that we should be guessing on rc if at all we have to guess one which one should i guess primary purpose should i guess uh, anchor phrase should i guess uh, you know inference based questions so we will be looking at that correct so um one other question that i have had from a lot of people i'm going to get into specific strategies for sentence correction cr and rc but uh, before that um last two answer options correct how many of you feel that you are between the last two answer options but you always get them wrong okay so if you feel that way that let's say you are between answer option c and d correct how many of you feel are you know i always feel that you know i get down to the last two but still i end up guessing it incorrectly okay so if you guess it incorrectly why don't you just go ahead and uh, yeah so divyansh feels that uh, Uh, one of those uh, souls who always ends up picking up uh, the wrong answer option correct but here is the deal divyansh okay i can fix this problem in under 10 seconds okay i can fix it in under 10 seconds and uh, this is how i would fix it last next time that you are between two answer choices let's say answer option c for charlie and e for echo right if you feel that you want to pick c don't pick c just go ahead and pick e right that would solve your problem right now that you are getting mostly these questions wrong with my suggested strategy right you should be getting it right but no as satyam correctly points out it's actually murphy's law correct 
Uh, those who are confused between answer option A and D, and let's say you had no other way for you to pick, you would have perhaps picked 50% of the chances. There's a 50% chance you would have picked A, and there is a 50% chance you would have picked D. Correct? But the point is, we end up, uh, you know, thinking that uh, we always get it wrong because we tend to have a memory of, we tend to remember what we picked wrong. We never tend to remember the answer options that we got right. Because when we go back to review in our error logs and all that, we say, Are, ha, this toy question, though I knew it, I was between answer option C and D, I picked answer option C. Uh, I don't know, there is nothing, you know, uh, for me to learn. But whenever you are between the last two answer options and you have actually gotten one of them right or wrong, doesn't matter, okay? Whether you got it right or wrong, doesn't matter. Ask yourself, okay? What was right about the wrong answer option? Something about the wrong answer option that I thought was right, correct? And something about the right answer choice that I felt was incorrect. So what you need to do is you need to ask yourself, what do I learn from this question? Next time I encounter, encounter such a question, am I going to learn something from it? Can I do it differently, correct? As long as you're learning that, please move on, right? There is only so much that you can get from that question, okay? so. That's really the, um, you know, uh, myth that you always get the last two answer options. You get the one round. Uh, let's do this. Let's now get specifically into uh, some guessing strategies for sentence correction. Okay. And what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to time you and I'm going to make sure that uh, you are uh, using just uh, two minutes because it's a sentence correction question. You should not take more than two. All right. So two minutes. Time starts now. All right, so two minutes over. So I see that a bunch of you have, uh, you know, solved this. So, okay. So actually, this is a question from, uh, I think it's an official question. You would have probably seen that on the OG. So in case you've seen that, um, you probably, uh, you probably might remember the trick. Here is the deal with this question, okay? So just go ahead and mark your answer, yeah. So this is the trick with this question. Uh, the question says on New York City ordinance of 1897, correct? And then it goes on to give you regulated the use of bicycles, mandated a maximum speed of eight miles per hour, required cyclists to keep feet on pedals and hands on handlebars at that time, and it granted pedestrians via right of way. 
Now, what happens when you read this question is that you realize that uh, you have the answer options, correct? Which all seem to have, uh, you know, some kind of parallelism going on, correct? So there is uh, regulated, there is mandated. So I'll tell you what would have been an answer choice that you would have uh, loved, okay? You would have loved an answer choice that said regulated, mandated, required, and granted, correct? All the four things in parallel. But if you think about it, there is actually a concept. It's a concept called superficial parallelism. Now, what happens with uh, tougher questions, and this is what happens with tougher questions, right, is tougher questions will always look a little easy, correct? Because when I look at it, I just jump and say, okay, regulated, mandated, and required, all three are parallel, so should be granted, correct? But then you justify saying that, oh, maybe regulated, mandated, required are parallel and granting is maybe this present participle, uh, you know, uh, kind of thing, correct? Um, so it's it's not, 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 not that I'm trying to say that you guys are wrong, okay? Uh, so look at it. The actual ordinance of 1897 was an ordinance that was doing something. Ask yourself, in parallelism, shouldn't all the items inside the list be parallel? So that's what you used. But there is another thing about parallelism, which is you need to remember that the lists that are parallel should all be similar items. Correct? Now, what you see over here is the overall regulation. Now, that is the superset. Correct? And then you have mandated, required, and all that, that seems to be the subset, correct? So what you realize is that regulated is actually not in the same list as the other four things. The other four things, or rather the other three things, are telling me how they were regulated, okay? So how they were regulated, okay, is they were regulated by mandating the speed, requiring them to keep feet, and granting them uh, some kind of uh, permission right of way, correct? So uh, the right answer choice, right, should actually use regulated, in which case I need mandating, correct? So none of the answer choices which have regulated have mandated also, regulating, a uh, regulator have mandating, correct? So answer option A and B go off because regulation and being mandated is not parallel. So A and B go off, correct? Excellent, Samarth. The three things are about bicycle. One of them is about the ordinance. What is the one thing that is about the ordinance? It is regulated. It is not regulated. It's regulating because we are using a present participle. Answer option A and B go off. Because what we are really saying is a New York City ordinance, what kind of ordinance? An ordinance regulating the use of bicycles is what I am looking at, correct? That entire thing is my noun phrase, starting with a New York City ordinance, going all the way till regulating the use of bicycles. Now, what did this ordinance do? This ordinance did three things, correct? It mandated it required and it granted. Look at answer option C. Mandated is fine. Required is fine. Problem is it says it granted. That takes off answer option C. Answer option D says regulating, mandating, requiring, all sounds great and granted. Doesn't make sense. D goes off. Leaves you with the right answer choice E which says we are talking about the New York City Ordinance of 1897. What did that ordinance do? It was regulating the use of bicycles, right? That is an adjective, remember. What did this do? Now you use the verb in the past tense. Mandate, past tense of that, mandated. Require, past tense, required. And grant, past tense granted so mandated required and granted are the three elements in parallel so e for echo is the right answer choice which i see a lot of you have got the main thing that i wanted to say from a question specific takeaway is tough gmat questions might be 
a little deceptive be careful correct so the idea is that we so uh, the idea is we always focus on what uh, gmat is testing and once you start hitting a verbal 40 and above what you will realize is just be sensitive don't fall for the obvious answer i am not saying overthink it don't get into an analysis paralysis but anyone who picked any of the other choice uh, uh, you know uh, choices uh, subjunctive form uh, is not should okay i'll i'll get back to this but i just wanted to main make sure that we get the points across correct so make sure that you don't jump to an answer choice especially as you get better on sentence correction i can guarantee the gmat test setter is going to give you one trap answer choice correct that looks very easy okay so make sure that you don't fall and if at all you did not find you could have also looked at other things to eliminate right right um so look at uh, uh look at uh, this thing right so if i were to look at it i would look at the word it correct and answer option c right there is no requirement for the word it required cyclist to do something correct uh, that's perfectly fine and answer option e there is no problem correct so it required so see again the idea is don't get into the subjunctive and all that chirag i don't think a lot of questions on the gmat would test you on this this is a simple parallelism question it's a superficial parallelism question correct so always look for other uh, you know kind of things in the question that could help you right and even on tougher questions i gave you only 2 minutes so on the gmat uh, one thing that i would like you to do is um, you know at some point you need to actually uh, go ahead mark an answer and move on okay so should is not a subjunctive form chirag you can't use should along with let's say a command subjunctive okay in fact command subjunctive and should will never come together you can take that as rule right so current the whole idea is that uh, uh, you know when we are we are looking at the traps because you have asked this question i'm just saying that we are looking at traps right so uh, if i were to uh, look at it right so how do i now uh, get to an answer let's say i am between two answer choices correct and i am expected to guess how do i guess one way to guess is take your eyes away from the rule that you are actually testing on for example let's say that you are between two answer option correct and uh, between these two answer options let's say answer option c and d correct you are looking for a problem with parallelism try to take your eyes away try to see some part else in the answer option and see if there is anything else that you could use maybe there is a subject verb error correct maybe there is a modifier problem correct so try to see if you can take your eyes or focus away from that error and look at some other error also ask yourself right what is happening over here on the test if you kind of feeling panicked and if you are not able to get into the uh, you know specific what do you do you ask yourself is it that i have no clue if i have no clue you are kind of getting lost you are reading the same sentence multiple times my suggestion go ahead make a blind guess and move on correct because many a times what happens on the gmat is especially when you are solving like a lot of questions it might happen that you read a particular sentence maybe it's three lines long completely underlined has multiple modifiers you know the kind of things that i'm talking about right what do you do when you do that there is really no answer to it right i mean you just need to guess and move on or you are between last two but you are confused what do you do here is what i would say it's a very important uh, rule uh, on uh, gmat and uh, you know assuming that the audience is also a predominantly indian audience i'm going to excuse myself by uh, you know saying this uh, i call this the gmd rule the gmd technique right anybody who studied in krakow knows that but at some point you have to say jai mata di mark an answer and move on correct it is like inky pinky ponky you have to mark an answer and move on what i have seen a lot of students do in practice is that they are between the last two answer options but they don't end up committing 
what they will do, they will look at the solution and then they will come back and say, huh, I was between answer option B and C, correct? But uh, you know what? I knew it was B and they'll go ahead and pick B, correct? Don't do that, right? So make sure that you're committing to an answer. If you can't commit to an answer choice on the GMAT, it's going to be very hard. Uh, just force yourself even if you're not comfortable, okay? That's a very, very, very crucial thing. A um, lot of people spend way too much time. You know, it's like this mad angle ad. You've seen that? What triangle, you know, you just keep rotating it. You'll keep reading the same two answer options, right? But without making progress. So make sure that you mark and move on. And the last thing that you should not worry about, okay, is picking the right one, but saying, you know what, it doesn't sound right, okay? That's a terrible way to, uh, you know, kind of uh, decide on sentence correction. I will tell you, all sentence correction questions are designed to make you feel uh, uncomfortable, correct? Uh, all tougher sentence correction questions will sound incorrect. So don't worry about that part. Okay, and uh, always eliminate for a good logical and grammatical reason. So what happens is if you have to guess, okay, here is here is another thing that I want to give. If you want to guess, right, you will do better guessing when you have only two answer options left, correct? Because what happens, your whole brain is going to just look at the difference between the two answer options. In fact, uh, while you are practicing also, you might have seen that, correct? That uh, uh, you should exactly, you should take your ear off, correct? But that's true, right? You need to have a good logical and grammatical reason. I'm going to underscore that, okay? It's a very, very important thing. However, when all things fail, you know, everyone, like I've been a test prep instructor and for the last 20 years, if there is one advice that I tell people in sentence correction is, please don't use your ears, right? <laughs> Try to use logic and grammar. But then, if there is nothing, please don't fence it, correct? What I'm saying is the fence-sitting part, where you're just reading the same answer choice, and inside your brain, there is almost like this cog, which is kind of caught, right? Like, it's just going round and round, but you're not making progress. All of us have experienced this, correct? So whenever you feel that way, you see that, you know, just reading the answer options is not going to help. Just make a, a guess and move on, okay? All right. So any questions based on uh, what we uh, discussed so far? We touched upon overall, uh, you know, uh, strategy for the GMAT itself. Uh, then we looked at sentence correction. Correct. Now I'm going to discuss a uh, technique for critical reasoning. Any questions? If you have, please, uh, you, you can type it into the chat. Okay, great. Chirag, so here is some great tip. And I know this from the fact that GMAT is not going to be using idioms as the make or break, correct? Which means you would not have a situation where the only difference between the two answer choices is going to be a preposition. However, let's assume that you end up in a situation where the difference between the two answer options is just a preposition let me tell you you are scoring above 45 or 46 raw score in verbal right out of 48 49 raw score you may get a question where the difference is only a preposition but uh, in that case also even if you make an error correct eventually you are going to end up with a great score a person who gets to a verbal 48 is never going to get dragged down to a verbal 35 correct so um, Really, that should be other reasons. If idioms is the only thing, there is nothing but to use your luck. As I said, Jai Mata Di, right? Any other questions? If not, I'll uh, move on to uh, critical reasoning. Right, so. Okay, so let me do this. Let me go ahead and uh, give you a question on critical reasoning now. Okay. Um, so. I'm going to give you another, I'm going to time you, just go ahead and start solving now.
Oh, I'm so sorry. I realized that uh, I don't have the PPT on the screen. So let me just do a share screen again. Sorry about it. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah, I've started the timer now. Two minutes over. Three minutes over. So at this point, if you have not been able to solve this question, correct? You just need to, you know the technique I've already taught you. So pick any uh, letter. So one more tip for guessing is uh, when you actually go on the GMAP. Uh, so one thing that I've seen is a lot of students, they end up uh, trying to guess which letter to pick right so they say oh you know what last question i picked d before that i picked c uh you know before that i picked b so maybe i should pick a correct because uh, the probability goes up nothing of that sort okay so what i would suggest if you want to make a blind guess pick a letter between a and d okay a b c d e or five options pick your favorite letter on the day of the gmat please don't waste extra time if at all you have to make a blind guess Please don't waste time trying to pick the right letter. Go ahead, mark C if that's your favorite number and go on. Those who marked C, did you mark C because you made a random guess? I'm just asking. Or was it a well thought out answer? I'm just asking. Anybody wants to accept that they made a guess? <coughs> Anybody? All of you are um, you know, very truthful and you actually went ahead and solved this question. Excellent. Correct. Now, really, what I'm going to do is I'm going to not spend 
a lot of time explaining this question because that's not the objective of uh, today's session correct we are somewhere around the 1 hour mark and i want to make sure that we have another you know 10 15 minutes and we are able to wrap it up so what i'm going to do is i'm going to directly jump to the crux the crux of this is look at the last part it says essentially tiger beetles okay it says that they are very fast runners okay but what happens is when they are uh running towards an insect they intermittently stop and then resume its attack so he's saying why do they do that they do that because the beetles cannot maintain their pace and must pause that is one reason second reason or second hypothesis they become blind correct so either they take rest or become blind one of two answers read the question important you read the question it says which of the following if discovered in experiments using artificially moved prey insects would support one of the two hypotheses and undermine the other undermine means weaken correct i'm going to jump to b for bravo and that's the right answer by the way so anybody who chose any other answer option b for bravo says in pursuing a swerving insect the beetle alters its course while running when it's swerving means it's changing its direction the beetle is able to alter its course it doesn't need to stop that means beetle is not turning blind which means you are supporting one hypothesis that it's or rather uh, let's just hold on let's look at the second part it pauses become more frequent as the chase chase progresses what it means is it is actually taking rest it is not turning blind remember there were two parts it should a support a hypothesis it's saying that yeah it is taking rest and it should undermine the other hypothesis what is that that they are not turning blind that that is what answer option b for bravo is doing what does c for charlie say c says in pursuing a moving insect a beetle usually responds immediately that means it is not turning blind but here is what it says it pauses equally frequently whether the chase is up or down and inclined which means it is not taking rest it is not turning blind it's not taking rest so you are actually undermining both the hypothesis that is why c goes off similarly other reasons to reject the other answer options are not going to get into that okay what i wanted to do was i wanted to ask you that if you are running out of time okay is this a good question to guess that's that's really what i'm trying to think let's assume that on the gmap you have 8 minutes okay and you realize that you have uh, let's say six questions left okay is this a good question for you to guess and i think there is a lag between um the the youtube live and the this so i'm just going to wait for people to respond on this not a good question yes naman right because what happens when you see this question on the gmap correct when you see this among 36 questions and you have under you have 108 seconds to respond remember that's the per average response time correct the incorrect question to ask is can i solve this you did it in 3 minutes right correct so i'm just asking is 3 minutes at you know when you have 8 minutes left correct and you have six questions if you are taken 3 3 and a half minutes for this question you would have been left with four and a half minutes correct and you would have been left with five questions you realize the kind of problem that you would have been in right so my take is this would have perhaps been a good question to guess if you are running out of time because this is a question that takes time more importantly it also takes a lot of mental effort right you just have to process it uh, the question itself is not hard right remember there is a difference between a tough question and a tedious question the first question that i gave you about rainfall was a tough question this one is not a tough question it's a tedious question which means that just solving it just requires energy and time if you give it energy and time you will be able to solve this question which is where we get tempted and that's what i'm trying to say that if at all i were to guess there are two ways in which i would have guessed it a i would have said you know what it looks like a very lengthy cr question cr exactly hrithik cr are the question types
where you end up taking a lot of time reading the stimulus. So if you feel uh, you wanted to make a blind guess, and remember, I'm telling you, eight questions, eight minutes, six questions. If you are in that kind of a scenario, this probably was a good question for you to guess. I wouldn't guess sentence correction, but I would guess this kind of a question. I can make a blind guess. But even if I were not to make a blind guess, do you know when I would make a guess again? I would make a guess after reading the stimulus. If I read the stimulus and I read it and somewhere during the reading the stimulus itself, I'm getting a sense that, you know what, this question is going to take a lot of time. Please use that judgment call. Okay, because if you're going to spend three, three and a half minutes solving this question, what is happening is the rest of the five questions, you're doing it a big disservice, right? You're going to randomly now pick two of the answer options. Just for this one question, you are sacrificing two other questions, correct? So I would probably, even if I were to, uh, you know, guess, what is the best time to guess? At the end of 30 seconds or at the end of three minutes? My take is, this is a question that, you know, you rather guess at the end of 30 seconds because ending, uh, guessing at 30 seconds, correct, is, is guessing, ending, uh, uh, giving, uh, you know, uh, the answer at the end of three minutes is not guessing. It is giving up. There is a difference between guessing and giving up, correct? And best is to guess after reading the prompt. Best is to say, you know what, I can't understand. Let me not even get into it. Remember, when you guess, you are in control of the test. Okay? If you are going to give up, it means GMAT has won the game. GMAT is now taken control. For every question, remember, guessing is only when you do it in under a minute. If you are going to go all the way till two and a half, three minutes, and then you're going to use Jematadi, that is a bad strategy because that's not guessing. I'm going to say that again. It's giving up. All right. Overall, for CR, remember, there are CR questions that can be time sinks. I know students, uh, you know, who have spent five plus minutes, correct, on a single bold face question. Because they just don't want to let go. Because there is a part of them that says, you know what? I've been practicing bold faces for the last three months. Correct? There is no way in hell I would not be able to solve it. So let me go ahead and solve it. Beware of time sinks. Correct? Uh, remember that uh, there is also a certain sunk cost bias that comes in CR. What is sunk cost bias? You went to see a movie, you bought popcorn, you sat down. First 30 minutes, you realize it's a lousy movie. But what do we do? We end up seeing the rest of the movie. Why? Because we have spent so much money on the ticket that we might as well watch the rest of the movie. It does not make the rest of the movie any better. Correct? Same thing in gambling, right? You lose $100, you're going to spend 10 more dollars trying to recoup so that your losses come to come 100 nay. It should be at least, you know, uh, 70, 80. So you're trying to recoup. Correct? Throwing bad money at bad money, right? So what happens? We end up spending, right, um, almost a minute or a so in reading the stimulus in CR. Think about it. Now what happens? Our brain tells you, one minute though, you already spent on reading the stimulus. Now let's go to the answer options and let's just try to spend at least another minute or two before we give up. And then that ends up adding to the time sink. Correct? Um, so I'm going to just take the question that Chirag had. What if you are not confident on the last two questions before facing a question which requires guessing? Consi Chirag, you have no option, right? The idea is that you have no option. If you guessed on the last question, I would probably be a little more circumspect before guessing on this one. But again, at some point, I need to guess. And why are you assuming that between the last two, you guess the wrong answer option? Always think this way. Maybe you guessed it correctly. Okay. Amit had this question, how much time can I spend on a long passage? Uh, Amit, if this is on reading comprehension, we are going to get that very soon. Okay. And uh, that's the whole takeaway. Learn when to guess, when, when to move on. Uh, and uh, this is not a question for you to waste time on. Okay. Any questions on, uh, on, uh, on CR? Anything else? Chirag had a question. Anything else apart from that? So uh, I'm not really sure uh, what what uh, you mean by uh, pre-thinking uh, in most difficult questions as good as in average questions. I, I don't know uh, what it is. 
uh, if you mean pre thinking as your ability to predict the answer options uh, my take is once you read the question the idea is you should just pause uh, before you hit the answer options just so that your brain understands uh, what are the things that you should probably eliminate what are the things that you should be looking at what you're really doing is you're processing the stimulus correct otherwise it's kind of foolish for you to kind of think what could be the answer options right i mean think about it it's like playing kbc many a times you would have seen the question which says which of these is a color blah 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 found on this flag and then we say red okay and then we see that the answer option does not contain red at all it's happened to you right you played uh, who wants to be a millionaire you probably face this issue so it's pointless for us to um, you know predict anything before the answer options come in so what i suggest instead is uh, you know we have a set of steps that we uh, teach in crack bubble one of the things is for you to hardwire your brain into knowing what to expect not to predict what the answer would look like okay um tanha asks should we guess on cr and avoid guessing on sc and rc you know what kanha i agree on sc okay but i'm going to come uh, to you on rc in fact that's exactly what i have uh, next which is uh, i'm going to be showing you uh, the technique for rc okay so if you're good uh, let's start with rc all right okay so here is what i'm going to do i'm going to give you a passage and i'm going to give you just one question right so i'm going to assume that you read the passage in about 2 minutes uh, uh, and i'm uh, assuming that you need let's say another 2 minutes for answering the questions pavan hold on to your question i'll be answering it uh, once i come back okay i've got the question that you have asked me i'm going to answer it once i come back uh, let's take this question i'm going to give you i'm going to be very liberal i'm going to give you a full uh 5 minutes for answering this because i am assuming that it takes about 2 to 1 half minutes for uh, reading the passage uh, maybe another 2 minutes or so for uh, answering the questions okay so just one question for you right so read the passage answer the question your 5 minutes starts now
I got about a minute left. Okay, so we are going to get till the end. So please go ahead and mark an answer. Right. All right, so we took about five minutes, right? And uh, you know, so go ahead and uh, even if you have actually uh, ended up uh, reading the passage in about two minutes, I would have expected this question to take another minute. So probably about three, three and a half minutes, you should have gotten the answer. So I see there is a mix between C, E and uh, B and D. Okay. Uh, so the first thing that you need to look at is the question, right? Did you read the question carefully? This is for those who chose any other answer option apart from C for Charlie, okay? If you did not, this is probably what happened. The way you read this, you read it as information in the passage suggests that which of the following is true of carotenoids and then you stop, right? Because in your brain, you're seeing that a male animal user, so you're not really... Uh, kind of, uh, you know, ask yourself exactly what the question is asking, correct? So now the male animal is using it for detoxification, correct? Again, I'm not going to be investing uh, time explaining. Uh, that becomes a separate thing uh, when we, you know, kind of get into reading comprehension. So one of the things that I always believe that in reading comprehension, uh, read the question, correct? Right answer choice over here is C. And why is it C? Because read this particular line which says, um, it may be that males can use scarce carotenoids either for immune defense and detoxification. What is the next word? Or, correct? Or for attracting females, correct? So you have one or two options for immune defense and detoxification b for attracting females question says what happens when the male uses it for detoxification you know that simultaneously they will not be using it for for displaying the color correct so they cannot be used simultaneously to brighten coloration which is why c for charlie which many of you have correctly identified is the correct answer, correct? Now, what is the takeaway more than solving this question? Uh, the first takeaway is remember to read the question carefully. I'll give you a classic trap that GMAT will do, especially when you look at big picture questions. When you look at questions like primary purpose or main idea, what GMAT will do is it will give you one answer choice that is factually correct but it is not the main idea. So you will go back and say, oh, but in answer option C, it does say this, right? I mean, it is correct. But remember, read the question. In fact, there is also another type of question on the GMAT where you will see this word in order to. While solving on GMAT or GMAT prep uh, on the mock test and the exam pack, uh, you will see a lot of questions which says in order to. Remember, in order to is a why question. The author mentions Brazilian economists in order to. Why does he mention the economists? Why? Not what the economists are saying. Correct? So that's where reading the question becomes very important on GMAT, reading comprehension. And 
a lot of times what happens is people look at words for example in this question there was a word simultaneously correct now what happens is we go back to the passage and we are asking ourselves ki what does it say happen simultaneously and because we are not able to find that word right we think this could potentially be a wrong answer option we are not feeling comforted so we end up knocking it off again be careful that's a trap there is a good reason why this is called reading comprehension not reading recognition we are not looking at doing a control f and finding words in the passage okay and if you are running out of time would this be a good question to guess well i really don't know right i mean uh, maybe maybe not uh, i would probably say that if you have not understood the passage uh, well uh, perhaps this is a question which would require you to go back understand analyze might take a little bit more time so perhaps perhaps because you are running out of time i might pick this as a candidate uh, for guessing correct now in general right uh, for reading comprehension remember that uh, the idea is not to solve all the three or four questions given to you okay don't walk into reading comprehension saying that i will answer all three or four questions what i would do under the, read the passage in under 2 minutes correct and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to probably pick one of the you know questions i'm going to keep i'm going to say to my tell myself that one question i'm going to go ahead and guess which one that's something that i need to figure out okay so we'll talk about that but before that one more thing the way the answer options are worded is a very important tool or a trick that is used by the gmat test setter think about it reading comprehension is the only topic in verbal where they have to give you the answers first and then ask you the questions correct so how do they trick you they trick you by giving wordings that are not going to make you feel comfortable and of all the question types which one is best to guess my take would be inference based questions correct if there is no background let's say one of those questions which says which of the following predictive uh, statement would the author most likely agree with okay there is no way you can solve this question unless and until you go back to each of the answer options right so a you go back to the passage b you go back to the passage right so these kind of questions invariably end up taking a lot of time especially if the right answer option is e because what happens is when we have five answer choices correct what happens when you look at answer option a and you fall in love with answer option a right has it happened to you sometimes that you just read it and answer option a just looked down correct this seems to be what the author is saying now what happens is um you know i have heard a lot of people say oh you should you know be careful you should still read answer option b c d e but you know what that's a technical answer a technical answer is keep answer option a but please be read answer option b c d e fully completely and make sure that uh, you have a good reason but i'll tell you what is a human behavior answer the human behavior answer over here is invariably when we have that scenario once we have picked a our brain will justify why b c d e are wrong so we tend to be a little faster when the right answer option is a but we tend to be a little slower when the right answer option is e just go ahead and look at the questions where you have picked answer option a and questions where you have picked answer option e you will realize that questions with answer option a you tend to be a little faster uh, especially for uh, you know uh, cr and rc but uh, questions where answer option e is the right answer choice you will end up invariably taking a lot more time but yeah that's my uh, suggestion which is to go ahead and guess uh, inference based questions all right and uh, finally just to make sure that we are on the same page on rc you cannot afford to guess an entire passage i mean you can do it right but if you're going to get three or four questions wrong it's going to penalize you heavily the algorithm is not your friend and uh, for that reason it is better that if you were to guess let's say you walk in with the strategy ki this passage i'm going to go ahead and blindly guess one question correct so that's what i had uh, in store for you uh, i uh, will get to some of the questions that you have had uh, but uh, let me just uh, look at it um, 
Pavan asked this question, are the sections in verbal independent of each other? They are not. They are connected. I've got this answer from GMAC. Uh, so you can take that to be uh, fairly, you know, uh, official. That's their official stance on it. Uh, Bharat Kumar asked this question. I think he's asked it for uh, critical reasoning. He asks, is it a good strategy to read the question first and then the premise? Okay. RC, CR, two different ball games. CR, you should be reading the question and then read the stimulus because you have only one question based on the stimulus. But in reading comprehension, please read the passage. Don't read the question first because there are two parts to your brain. When you're reading it the first time, it is called skimming. Skimming is when you read the newspaper without knowing what to expect. Okay, But when you go to the questions and then you get back to the passage in order to answer a question, what you're doing is you're doing scanning. Okay, so skimming is a different technique, scanning is a different technique. If you end up reading the first question, what happens? You will end up scanning to begin with. I'm talking about reading comprehension. You will end up scanning, you'll end up looking for the answer. What happens because of that is you're going to miss the larger context of the passage, which you will be able to get only if you do skimming. Okay, so for reading comprehension, please don't read the first uh, question. And anyways, if the question is, what is the primary purpose of the passage? It's still not going to help you, correct? But in critical reasoning, yes, most definitely you should be reading the question before you read the stimulus. Um, so I have one more question from Kana. Uh, I'm going to take the last three, four uh, questions and then uh, we'll kind of for this. So Kana says, but if we guess uh, because we didn't get the passage, then what do, uh, then what to do? In the next question, we have to read the passage again for reference. So wouldn't it be wise to take some extra time for the question? Uh, so Kana, the idea is that uh, we are reading the passage in about 90 seconds the first time round, correct? And then we are hitting the question, okay? Now, at some point, you need to make an educated guess, okay? You are not making the guess because you did not understand the passage. You have to understand that. Because if you did not understand the passage, Correct. For each question, you have to anyways go back to the passage. Now, after reading the passage multiple times, if you still don't get what the passage is going to say, you're going to get all the three or four questions wrong. I am going with the assumption that you have to understand the passage. At least you have to understand 20, 30 percent of the passage, if not more. Correct. But with that much of understanding, you need to take a stab at the questions. All right. Amit Chatterjee had this question. How long do you keep yourself emerged in a long passage? Doesn't matter. Long passage, short passage. Here is my thumb rule. Uh, two minutes for reading the passage, uh, four to five minutes for answering the questions. You should not take more than eight minutes for any RC passage. RC can be your worst enemy. OK. Um, Nitin Agarwal had this question. Do I take GMAT classes? Yes, I conduct GMAT classes. I also conduct workshops in Mumbai, Delhi. Uh, we also have an entire online course which is based on me teaching. I actually come in front of the camera and teach you the GMAT verbal. Uh, my uh, uh, colleague Aditya has actually uh, shot the quant module. So we are the two instructors at Crack Verbal for our online course. Um, Amit Chatterjee, how long do you keep? I already answered that. Um, uh, to, 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 to. Last question, Pavan, I'm going to answer this and then we're going to call it a day. Okay, it's already been a little stretched. We have gone for about an hour and a half, which is a little more than what I had anticipated. So I'm going to take this question. It is better to guess the last few questions or leave them unattempted. Okay, so first of all, uh, I think this is a, a, a useless question to ask at this point because please keeping your pacing chart with you, right? You should not realize on question number 33 that you are running out of time, correct? One of the strategies that we teach is also to have the pacing strategy so that you are guessing earlier on. Here is a very cool tip. All your experimental questions will be towards the middle of the test. You will not get it at the start or the end of the test. Okay. This is something that I've heard from, you know, official sources. Let's put it that way. So what you want to do is you will mistake throughout the test rather than stacking them towards the end. So Pavan, both of these, I would disagree are bad strategies. I would say start guessing early on. And uh, Jayati, um, how do we decide which questions to skip? 
Jaita, that is exactly the thing that we need to, uh, you know, and I'm happy that you asked this because this is the last question that I'm going to take. I happy you asked this question. That's what we are training ourselves for. Remember, this is not a test of English or maths. This is not a test of grammar. If this were to be a test of grammar, your high school grammar teacher would get into Harvard. It doesn't work that way. Correct. What GMAT is looking at is your ability to make executive decisions, saying that when you are under time pressure, what is going on in your head? Are you able to kind of think clearly? Are you able to avoid traps? That's what it's really asking you. Correct. So my take, go ahead with a set of things. For example, uh, I could choose if I want to make a blind guess, I'm going to make a blind guess, not on sentence correction. But if I want to make it on sentence correction, it will be one where the entire line is underlined and there are uh, multiple modifiers. In reading comprehension, maybe it's an inference-based question. In CR, maybe it's a question where the stimulus is too long. So, so I will fine-tune when I'm actually taking the practice tests. All right? So um, yes, Anudeep, this is another thing. People think that once I score 760, see 42 in verbal. Let me give you an example. A guy who scores 42 in verbal would have seen questions at 48 levels. He has got those questions wrong, which is why he's getting 42. You can make six to seven mistakes and still get a 40 plus score. Why? Because this is not a linear algorithm. Every question that you're wrong, um, you're getting wrong, you're penalized for it. So what happens when you see a guy scoring 42, what you're not seeing is that guy has got a uh, fought a battle, I got to 44, 45, you know, made mistakes, got down to 42, made mistakes, got down to 38, gone up to 40, you know, fought his way up to 42. All of this has happened. But what is presented to us in the end is just a two-digit GMAT score, right? The raw score. But actually, you can make a lot more mistakes even for you uh, to get 42. Uh, we are getting into the scope of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the actual uh, 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 this. What I will do is uh, I would suggest that you read, um, you know, the Crack Verbal blog. Uh, we have actually written about uh, the algorithm. There is a very detailed, uh, uh, you know, four or five thousand uh, um that's a great question. Let me just give you my email ID. So uh, please, uh, you can get in touch with me on my email ID, which is uh, Arun uh, at the rate, Arun J uh, at the rate. I'm just giving it to you. So yeah, if you uh, can do it, Anudeep, uh, if you can just uh, paste that blog over here, it is uh, demystifying GMAT scores, I think. This is my email ID. Uh, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn as well, okay? Uh, I'd be glad to do that. And uh, uh, please, uh, you know, uh, subscribe to us on YouTube. And uh, I have, uh, I'm going to be, we're going to be coming back with a lot of interesting webinars. Uh, I'm going to be, uh, you know, also contributing, posting on the threads. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. I'll be more than glad to take my experience and uh, help you, especially with the strategy parts, all right? Thanks a lot. I hope uh, this uh, webinar was useful. I stayed true to what I said, which is I'm going to make the next 90 minutes, next 60 minutes worth your time. So uh, I really hope uh, that you liked it. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I will just wait for your comments. And after that, uh, we will be uh, ending the webinar. Right. Thank you. Have a great, wonderful uh, weekend ahead. And um, all the best for your GMAT prep. Uh, if you have any uh, requirement, any help, you know where to reach out to. Thank you.